Hello chemists, this is Ms. Placino and you are watching Screencast 14.6 on polymerization. Today we're going to talk about different types of polymerization reactions. Uh, we'll talk about what a polymer is and how we represent a polymer using a structural formula. Let's start off with some terminology. First up we have monomer. Uh, given what you know about the prefix mono, you're thinking well that means one, um, a monomer is just going to be a small simple molecule. If we take many monomers and we join them together, we get a polymer. You know the prefix poly means many. So a polymer is a large molecule. These can be extraordinarily large molecules made up of these smaller repeating units called monomers. It's not uncommon in a polymer to have hundreds of thousands, potentially even millions of monomers bonded together. So we have this very large molecule, but if you look at it, um, you have the same small unit repeating again and again and again. Now there are some simple, uh, some important characteristics that our monomers have to have. It's not that any small simple molecule will do, um, but the polymers that we're going to look at, the monomers do tend to be small, especially when we're talking about man-made or synthetic polymers, and relatively simple. Uh, nature is much better at making polymers that we are than we are, and you'll see larger monomers but don't get too hung up on the details. Uh, for the time being, just know that monomers, when they're joined together, will make polymers, these gigantic molecules that just kind of repeat themselves again and again and again. Representing polymers with a structural formula would take pretty much your entire life maybe to draw one polymer. So we need to drastically cut down on the amount of time it takes to represent a polymer. There is no way you'd want to represent it with a structural or a molecular formula. It's just going to take too long and it's going to be relatively meaningless. So let's look at this reaction. Uh, we have ethene, just carbon, double bonded to another carbon and with the four hydrogens, C2H4. It's going to undergo polymerization, uh, specifically addition polymerization, but we'll talk more about reaction, ty uh, reaction types in just a little while. And basically what happens is you get a whole bunch of CH2 molecules together, and I'm just going to demonstrate it with one. And you can imagine the double bond breaks, and we're going to form a bond between the two carbon atoms of neighboring um, ethene groups. And then in turn, this double bond has to break, and we can just kind of like have a big domino effect, and you can get the ethene, mo uh, ethene molecules essentially to turn into ethanes and just bond together in a very long repeating string. Um, so I need to cut that off at a certain point because otherwise I could just draw hundreds of carbons bonded together. Uh, so a lot of times you'll see either square brackets or sometimes just regular parentheses with our monomer in it once it's now part of the polymer, so it's not exactly the same. It's what does it look like after the polymerization reaction has occurred. And then I put this subscript of N outside the brackets or parentheses. And this just means that the unit is repeating itself indefinitely. Now, of course, this has to end at a certain point in time. Um, it's not going to go on for infinity. Uh, but for all practical intents and purposes, you might as well think about it that way. Um, it does not matter how many times it repeats. The key is, well, what is the repeat unit? Um, so it's more important to just kind of show what unit is repeating itself than it is to try to represent the whole molecule. You see polymers every day. Uh, so we'll play a quick game called Name That Polymer. We'll start off with natural polymers first, and you're going to see that nature is so much better at making polymers than we are. Make your biology teacher proud. What is this? Yeah, this is DNA. Uh, RNA is kind of in the same category. If you think about it, you have this um, double helix structure where essentially the rungs of that ladder kind of just like twisting around. Um, those are repeating sugar and phosphate units. And then you have, I should say, the, uh, the sides of the ladder. The rungs are your nitrogenous bases, and they're just going to repeat again and again and again, hundreds of millions of times. Uh, so very large macromolecule, very complex, and you know it doesn't repeat itself in the same exact manner every single time. Another natural polymer. 
Yeah, this is starch. Uh, we can take monosaccharides or single sugars. We can bond them together, get like a disaccharide. If I take glucose plus fructose, I make sucrose. And if I take many monosaccharides or many disaccharides, I can string them together and I can get a polysaccharide, uh, basically just a starch, a very uh, long repeating chain of simple sugars. All right, here's our next polymer. Probably can't guess from looking at the structure alone, but maybe the picture of that crab helps out a little bit. No, a crab is not a polymer itself, but its shell is a polymer. It's made out of something called chitin. Um, so we've got our repeating units. We've got two of them shown here. Uh, just again and again and again, it's gonna give um, the crab shell yeah, that's characteristic texture. This one's going to be potentially a tough one. You might not have talked about this in like an intro bio class. It's another polymer that's really important in your body. This is supposed to represent a protein. Uh, we know that proteins are made by joining many, many amino acids together. And uh, in a protein, the individual amino acids, um, in many cases, aren't quite as important as the structure of the whole protein. So a lot of times proteins are represented with these really colorful, pretty structures called ribbon structures to try to show scientists a little bit more about the shape of that protein instead of the uh, specific chemical makeup. So natural polymers tend to be much more complicated than we can make. But let's look at a couple of those. Uh, so synthetic or man-made polymers. Water bottles are made of plastic. Plastics are polymers. There are many different types of plastics. I've got poly, polyacetide here. Um, I've got a much simpler repeating unit, uh, but you can see that I've got this ester linkage existing between my monomers, and I just have a carbon chain. Um, I've got my methyl group sticking off, and this is just going to repeat any number of times. Um, as we kind of change exactly what the polymer is, uh, exactly, sorry, what the monomer is in our plastic polymers, we're going to get different properties of plastics. Uh, so something like a, a plastic bag that you get from a grocery store that is a very elastic polymer. It's going to stretch, where something like a water bottle is going to be more rigid. What are these? These are nylons. Nylon is a polymer. Um, specifically, the one that I've shown you is nylon 6. Any guesses on how we got this as nylon 6? Yeah, count your carbon atoms. I've got five carbon atoms present here, and then I've got this carbon that's present on the carbonyl group. Uh, there's also nylon 3 and nylon 9, and their properties are going to be a little bit different from nylon 6, mostly about elasticity. You probably recognize these as styrofoam cups. Styrofoam is a trademark name, but polystyrene is the um, polymer. So we have a long repeating chain of carbons, and then we have a big benzene ring sticking off of one of them. Uh, polystyrene, not the most environmentally friendly uh, polymer on the planet. These take an extremely long time to break down as they are very stable. And finally, no, pans and pots are not polymers, uh, but the coating that goes on the non-stick ones can be a polymer. This is Teflon. Teflon is another long chain of carbons, except this time instead of having um, hydrogens bonded to it, we have all fluorines bonded to it. And we get that really unique property of non-stick pans. Um, how they get it to stick to the metal itself is, is pretty interesting. All right, so we just went over a couple different polymers that exist. I want to talk a little bit about synthesizing polymers. And in reality, based on um, screencast 14.4, you already have the tools you need. We can make a polymer through addition polymerization. Given what you know about addition reactions in general, what characteristic would you expect your monomers to have in order to undergo addition polymerization? Hopefully you're thinking that the monomer has to be unsaturated. We need something like an alkene with its double bond or an alkyne with a triple bond in order for this type of reaction to occur. So we're gonna have unsaturated monomers. And we've already talked about this one. Uh, we've got our ethene undergoing polymerization and just getting a long repeating chain of CH2s. So we'll break the double bond. We'll see that domino effect of um, that now broken double bond needing to react with other C2H4 molecules, and we just get a very, very long repeating chain. 
Again, you have to use alkenes or alkynes. This will not work with simple alkenes. There's no real reason for them to undergo polymerization. There's no part of the molecule to attack like a double bond. The other type of polymerization reaction is condensation polymerization. When you think condensation, what small molecule do you think of? Good chance you're thinking of water right now. What other reaction did we talk about where water is a product? Again, we'll keep it to organic chemistry reactions only. Yeah, during the esterification reaction, we took um, an organic acid and an alcohol. We removed water and created ester linkages. That's essentially what condensation polymerization is. We're going to use these dehydration reactions, the removal of water, to join together polymers that have hydroxyl groups. So in this case, we still have that acid, and we still have an alcohol. So it's the same sort of removal of water. The difference is, instead of just having an acid group and an alcohol group on a single side of the molecule, if you look on the opposite side, they have the same functional group. As a result, we're going to be able to um, get this ester linkage to repeat itself again and again and again. Um, but in order for this type of polymerization reaction to occur, you of course need to have molecules that have hydroxyl groups present. Namely, organic acid groups, C double bond O, single bond OH, and then um, alcohol groups with just the hydroxyl. All right, guys, that wraps it up for today. Um, things that you should be able to take away from this lesson. Make sure you're comfortable with the terms monomer and polymer. Make sure you understand how polymers are represented. We'll just represent this one right now. Put brackets or parentheses around the repeating unit and then put a little N as a subscript outside of that to kind of communicate that, all right, this unit is going to repeat again and again and again, um, essentially indefinitely. Uh, natural polymers are much more complicated looking than our synthetic polymers, but either way, they've got the same general characteristic. You're going to take a small unit and you're going to repeat it ad nauseum. Make sure you understand how polymers are made. Um, you should be able to look at a monomer and determine whether it would be better suited for condensation polymerization or addition polymerization. All right, guys, that's all I've got for today. Thank you for tuning in, and I hope you found this helpful.